It didn't stop you, though, in a lot of cases, it sounds like. It didn't stop us. It made it more challenging. You could get into a lot of systems in a matter of minutes. Hey everyone, it's David Bumble back with Occupy the Web. For those of you who haven't seen previous videos, he's the author of this book, fantastic book. He's also got this book, Getting Started, Becoming a Master Hacker, another great book. Lots of experience, lots of information that he can share with us. Uh, Occupy the Web, welcome. Thank you, David. Good to be back. It's great to have you. You know, one of the things that, you know, this is my little knock to YouTube hacking videos, okay? <laughs> <laughs> is, is YouTube hacking videos always, you know, everything works perfectly the first time, you know, and it takes two <laughs> minutes to hack, right? When those of us who actually do it know that sometimes you can spend hours and days and weeks, you know, trying to get into a system. If it's a valuable system, it's worth it, but it's not gonna happen like a YouTube video, right? YouTube videos, and this is not a knock to YouTube videos, this is a knock to the people who are putting up those videos. They oversimplify a lot of these tasks. And, and it's true in some cases that you can get into systems in two minutes, right? We, we all, we've all done those. But in reality, most systems in a relatively secure world that we're living in today, you're going to have to work. And it's time consuming. It's hard work. So be prepared for that. In this case here, we had like 15 people working on this task. And each one of them was able to contribute, you know, some pieces of this task. The problem with a YouTube video, I'll, I'll give you the counter to that, is if you do a brute force attack against a password and it takes five hours or five days, no one's going to watch the video. Because exactly. they're not going to sit and watch for five days. <laughs> no, exactly. Right. It's like, uh, I, 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 I mean, it's point taken and it's valid real world feedback. I mean, the problem when you do like a YouTube video, if you want to demonstrate a concept, you can't spend five days in a video looking at something like going round and round and round. No one's going to watch it. People want to see something that's going to you know, be done in five minutes or 10 minutes or what yeah. have you. But just understand, all of you who are watching this video, oftentimes hacking and cracking is a time-consuming task that in some cases, there have been cases, well, for instance, you know, the Stuxnet. That was a multi-year project, okay, to take over one machine, a very high value target, but they spent years to do it. It was like a three-year project, all right? So, you know, if, if somebody shows you how to do that in a five-minute video, just be aware that it really took a lot of time to put that together. Often hacking is glamorized. So let's talk about that because you're, you're doing this for years and years. How glamorous is, is it? Is it like those typical, like, spoof videos that you see or what you know what my mother thinks I'm doing what my you know family <laughs> thinks I'm doing and what I'm actually doing is it like a lot of monotonous boring stuff there's a lot of monotonous work there's a lot of hard work and I think that's what we want to communicate yep. to people is that if you've watched you know a movie or yeah. TV Mr. show Mr. Robot yeah. they make it glamorous Mr. Yeah, I actually, I love Mr. Robot, as, as you may know. I, I love Mr. Robot because at least in Mr. Robot, he's actually using real techniques, okay? A lot of movies, you know, there's like the spinning geometric shapes and on the screen, and, and he, he breaks the password in 30 seconds or what have you. In Mr. Robot, he actually is using real-world tools and yeah. techniques, Um but the time frame is what's unreal in Mr. Robot because, like you say, nobody wants to watch a brute force attack that takes five weeks. Yep. <laughs> nobody's going to stick around. To, nobody's going to stick around for that, right? Um, it's not going to be a very good movie for sure or YouTube video. Yeah. In this video, I'm going to show you how to crack a Wi-Fi password. It told me that it was going to take like to the next bang. One eternity later. more than 10 years to crack it. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. Please like the video and click on the bell to get notifications. What's the quickest you've done a hack and what's the longest you've done for a hack? Can you give us sort of like the, the extremes? Well, I mean, there are have been these cases that always come. First of all, things have gotten more secure in 
in my career. Okay, so there was a time, you know, not too long ago where you could get into a lot of systems in a matter of minutes because people just weren't very concerned about security. Now, as you get, again, you come up against more secure systems and it depends upon the value of the system too you know if it's trying to get your neighbor's wi-fi password (laughs) you're probably not going to commit days and weeks to it if you're talking about the russian nuclear facility then you might commit years to that (laughs) and millions of dollars yep and millions of dollars right so that's that's going to be a really a, a difference in how much resources and time you're going to commit to it. Recently, I taught um, a SCADA hacking class. And in the SCADA hacking class, we actually use real-world targets. I don't know if I just say that, but we do. We'll not show that on YouTube, but it's fine if no. you do that in your classes, yeah. That's what I do. That's, another, class, reason, that's another reason you have to be careful what we put on YouTube because YouTube will pull the video down. But I mean, if it's, I if it's in your class, then you can show real-world stuff, and that's brilliant. We don't do anything malicious, okay, in these, in these classes. What we do is that we try to demonstrate how insecure these SCADA systems systems are. And so, yeah, we're like, will this work? Will this work? Will this work? And in some cases, we just kind of, you know, randomly choose SCADA systems around the world and we try different techniques to hack into them. Every class I've ever taught, we are able to get into some of these systems in a matter of minutes. This is the present. These are random systems, right? This isn't an educational lab system. These are real world systems and we can get into them in a matter of minutes or we can pull their memory out of them. And of course, we now, we, we know after this last vulnerability report that came out that these memory areas contain passwords. So if we know where to look in memory, we can pull the memory and get the password and the system. In any case, so some of them, it's a matter of just a couple of minutes. And in some cases, it's weeks and months, you know, and that's what the, the Russians are really good at is that they, they don't give up. You know, they are persistent. They will be back tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day until they find a way into your system. Let's use this real world example. How many cameras approximately did you guys get access to in Ukraine and how long did it take? I'm not going to give you the exact figure. I will put it in the hundreds. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll say that. Actually, we got most of them done with 15 people. We got most of them done in about a week. See, I mean, that's quite worrying because, I mean, it's like a, a dedicated team of 15 people. It's amazing what you can accomplish in a week. And they're not all expert hackers. Some of them you know, were kind of lower level and we gave them, you know, easier tasks and some of them were pretty sophisticated. But with everybody working together, we were able to, you know, get into hundreds. Let's put it that way. <laughs> what worries me is the SCADA systems that you can just randomly choose stuff on the internet and get access to these systems, which, I mean, it's like we spoke about a few times, it's real world damage. It's not just a credit card that you've stolen yep. from an individual, which is bad, but I mean, you could, affect hundreds or thousands of lives. Yes. Yeah, in this case, it's these, these are cameras, and cameras generally are not that well protected. In general, people don't protect them. I wouldn't compare it to a highly secure environment because people put up cameras and oftentimes they're put up there like in some of these cameras, they appear to be, we don't know who owns them, but they appear to be security cameras, you know, put up in a parking lot or on the street. And people, they're not concerned about revealing confidential information because it's just for internal use to be able to view what's going on outside on the street or in an office, in a grocery store. Or we have, I was showing one the other day where we're actually inside this grocery store, which is, you know, it's kind of enlightening because we see all the horrible pictures from Ukraine of the devastation. But in reality, most of the country, life goes on as normal. People are going to the grocery store and buying bread and buying bananas. And and that's what most of the country looks like. So we forget that, that most of the people who are in Ukraine right now are just trying to live a normal life, going to school, going to work, catching the bus. And that's what some of our cameras are capturing. Because most of the population of Ukraine, they're not fighting the war. The war is mostly in the east and the south. And much of the population 
is in Kiev and Lviv and other places. And so those are, we have cameras in those places and people are just going about their everyday lives. They're, you know, like I said, they're, they're going to school, they're going to work, they're catching the bus, they're going to the grocery store. Very normal life with rockets going over their heads. <laughs> it's, it's, it's unreal. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah one of the th questions that came up in this interview with this French um news station is that they asked, you know, we've been working on hacking the IP cameras in Ukraine in the last week or so. So we we got a request from Ukraine to, they said, here's a list of IP cameras that we'd like access to, and we want to be able to watch the Russians, you know, so that if they commit additional atrocities, we can keep an eye on them. And so the reporter asked me, he says, well, do you have cameras in the areas where the, the Russians are right now in the east? And I said, well, you need two things to access a camera. You need internet access, and you need electricity. There is neither one of those in those areas right now. We can't access the cameras in Donbass, in Mariupol, what have you, because they've knocked out all the internet access and there's no not even electricity in Mariupol right now. We've got much of the rest of the country covered right now. We've got access to street cameras, office cameras. The idea here is to one, if there are additional atrocities that are committed, that we can capture that and capture the people's faces who commit them. And two, we'd like the Russians to know that we have these cameras. And hopefully that deters their bad behavior. You know, human beings, when they think nobody's watching, can do some horrible things. But if they think there's even a chance that somebody is watching them, they will tend to act better, act more responsibly, act more humanely. The people in Bucha, they thought they could do that and never get caught and nobody was watching. If they thought that there was cameras watching them, it's likely that they would not have committed those atrocities. We're telling Russia now, look, we've got cameras throughout Ukraine. You do that again, we got your face. And your face is going to be taken to the ICC. Some people have you know, come to me and said, well, you know, the ICC is powerless against Russia because Russia is never going to give up their people to the ICC. And I, I would agree with that. You know, the Russians are never going to give up their people to the ICC. So talking about prosecuting Russians for war crimes in the ICC is probably an exercise in frustration. But at the same time, I think that if the Russian soldiers know that we can see their faces when they're doing these things, hopefully that has an effect of deterring or limiting their behavior to act more humanely, even if it doesn't go to the ICC. Nobody wants to be seen in their worst moments, right? And Russian soldiers, we will capture you. We will capture images of you the next time that you do the things that you did in Bucha. Let's get technical for a moment. How do you find online systems? I know you've got um, some articles again on your website, but let's talk it through for people who haven't read those articles. How do you find the systems? Well, you know, there's a number of, of OSN techniques to find the cameras. I mean, the easiest one is to use Shodan. Shodan, by the way, all it does is that it pulls the banner off every IP address and port in the world. And that banner often includes technical details of what's behind it. If you know, say, for instance, you use SCADA systems, Schneider Electric or Siemens or any of the others, when you pull the banner off their systems, it will tell you this is a Schneider Electric system, right? <laughs> and so what Shodan does is take all that information and puts it into a huge database and indexes it so you can search for those banners. So if you know the type of camera or know what's in their banner, you can can basically search Shodan for those key words in the banner. Now, it may not be the name of the camera. It may be, you know, something else that's in the banner. So if you pull the banner, so for instance, if you have one IP camera and you have a particular brand and pull the banner on it, then you can use that information to search for all the cameras in the world. Okay, of that manufacturer. It's like a fingerprint of the camera, yeah? It's a fingerprint of the camera, yeah. exactly. In some cases, in many cases, it's actually the manufacturer puts their name in their fingerprint. But in some cases, it's not. And you just got to know what that fingerprint is. And once you know that fingerprint, then Shodan will show you where all of them are in the world. 
There's also tools like Census and some others that also uh, scan the world and put it all into a database that you can search for uh, that key information. So you can identify the cameras that way. And then in some cases, the cameras aren't even protected. So what about passwords? Don't people put passwords on their cameras? Because uh, I, I know the answers, but uh, like you tell, tell for everyone, because a lot of people, like you said, I understand. In, who start with this may, may just assume, well, people put passwords on their cameras. Some cameras are installed and people don't put passwords on them. And, and that's oftentimes they're like security cameras or they're street cameras, what have you, and they won't put passwords on. So those are easily accessed through, say, something like Shodan. The second opportunity for you is that very often they're installed with default passwords. So you go to the manufacturer's website and find out what the default password is and try those out. And quite frankly, we found an awful lot of these, these cameras that we have in Ukraine, we found an awful lot that default passwords in them. And they, what they've done on these is that they put in other usernames and passwords, but they left the default still in place, so, so there'll be there'll be like oh, wow. three or four there'll be three or four users in there. I know you said you d you don't like to say humans are the weakest link or the, the 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 biggest problem, but it it's often either because they don't have technical knowledge or they don't know how to secure systems or whatever or just mistakes that this kind of stuff happens. We've all probably worked in an environment where we've got a thousand things to do. Yep. You do, I do. I've got every day. I've got a thousand things to do. Yeah, right? I can't always give all of my attention to all of those things. Right? Sometimes I have to cut some some corners someplace. And you know, you can imagine where you know, you have somebody who's setting up IP cameras. Who that's not their real job. They, you know, they've been told go set up the IP cameras. We need those. You know, on the building over there. And they go up there and they set it up and they go back to their desk and it works. And okay, they forgot, they forget about it then. You know, it works, they're just done. And nobody said, well, you got to make it secure. I, I published a, a list of default passwords for SCADA systems. And one guy wrote me and said, nobody would ever leave the default passwords in place on a SCADA systems. And I said, go look around. You yeah. know, yeah. I, I've, been in, I've been into many, many systems around the world on default passwords. On the videos that I do on YouTube, so many people say, this is dumb because no one's gonna do this. No one's gonna use a basic password. But you know, what you're telling me is, you know, that happens all the time. Happens all the time. On, on big industrial systems yep. where there's billions of dollars at stake. Mad. Somebody's left in the default passwords. <laughs> Mad. What happens if they don't? Because I mean, on your website, you were talking about how to crack passwords. So let's say they do change the passwords. How do you get around that? There's multiple ways of cracking passwords. And after cracking all these IP cameras, a lot of people have been coming to say, how do I crack IP cameras? Of course, everybody wants to know that, right? In all the time I have been in this business, the most, the, <laughs> the most uh, common request that I get is, how do you, how do you crack webcams? How do you crack IP cameras? And well, hack Facebook for all, me. You know, I yeah, get that all the time. Hack, yeah. Exactly. Go on. And, and you know, it's almost always you know the the husband or yep. the boyfriend <laughs> yeah. or or the wife or you yep. know they want to they want to they want to get into the other's cameras. So. Uh, and I basically ignore yep. those requests, but here we have a legitimate use of IP camera hacking. And so I, I've designed a class that we're going to offer in December. And the reason it's in December is because I'm hoping the war is over. Okay. At December, I don't want to offer this class now because it can be used for malicious purposes during this war. And it might actually compromise what we've already done. I don't want somebody else coming in and changing the passwords on the systems that we already have. We've scheduled it for December, so put that on your calendar. You want to learn how to hack IP cameras, you know, come to our course in December. Even if the war is not over by then, I think the usefulness of the cameras may be past. Right now is when it's really important that we be able to access the streets in the offices of Ukraine in this next phase here as the Russians try to push eastward. But in any case, so there's unprotected cameras, there's default passwords, there's, you know, you can use things like Burp Suite to be able to essentially run a password cracker through these systems. What we found is that all these cameras are manufactured outside of Eastern Europe. 
Okay. So they all use a Latin alphabet. Interesting. <laughs> so, yeah, we were. That was one of the first things we had to address. Is that okay? If these are all, all the passwords are in Cyrillic alphabet, how do we do that? We would yeah. have to some. We'd have to convert all of our tools into a Cyrillic alphabet. But they're made in China and in the U.S. and in the West, and so they all use a Latin alphabet. So that made it easier. Nearly all the cases, what we could do is use the default username and just then cycle through passwords. Because even though if people changed the default account, they left the default username in place. And so that's pretty easy to go through you know, a, a password list of 10,000 or 100,000 passwords. And, and you're, you're doing that you're online, gonna... so you're constantly tr trying to break into the, the, the camera, is that right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Many of the manufacturers have ways that you can change your password remotely. It's going to vary by camera manufacturer, but you can change your password remotely. All right. So, all right. That makes it easy for us. <laughs> but you have to have you have to have some basic understanding of the camera, and each manufacturer is slightly different. We've got a lot of them by simply going through the manufacturer detailed how to change the password remotely. And so we were able to get a lot of them that way. It's a combination of multiple techniques. So basically, firstly, find the cameras that have no passwords on. Shodan is a way to do that. And then try the default passwords because a lot of people leave them as default passwords or like leave a create new users, but forget to remove the default password. And then you can crack the passwords using Hydra or Burp Suite. Is that right? Right. I saw on your website, you've got like dictionaries of passwords. So did you try those or did you have to do like uh, brute force? No, what brute force is, is really time consuming for yep. remote hacking. If you're trying to brute force a, a hash that you have on your system, I mean, you can run through millions of passwords in short, short order. But when you're talking about remote, you actually have to send the username and password. Each one, wait for a response. So it's very much slower than offline password cracking. So what we did is that we used common passwords with common usernames and we're able to get a lot of them that way. Of all the, the cameras that we got, we had a few that were basically not protected, a lot of them that had default credentials in them. We had a number of them that had multiple usernames and passwords, but they left the default credentials in. We were able to crack some of them, and we were able to also um, use the manufacturer's remote password change techniques and that's going to say that's going to vary by manufacturer all that information is online you just have to look for it exactly all the information is online you know there's no mysteries here it's it's hard work though <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's time consuming hard work so what we did is we got a team all working together on it so it was multiple people if it was just a single person working on it it would have taken a lot longer but when you have 10 15 people and that's what we had working on it i think each of them was able to crack a few of them, and then we put it all together, and we've got uh, cameras throughout Ukraine right now. Did the cameras not, um, or the, the CCTV systems not, after three attempts, it blocks you or waits a long period of time? They don't implement basic stuff like that? Well, some of them did. Yeah, okay. Some of them did. Yeah. So we got some of them that was, you know, a lot of them, it's four attempts, and then they'll yep. block you. Okay. And then you come in with another IP address <laughs> yeah. and you try again. So it's, it's time consuming to do. I have to ask this question. So because I get a lot of flack from people that say, David, you do a lot of red team stuff or hacking, but you don't show us how to protect systems. So what's your advice to the security professionals or the, you know, the networking people, whatever companies, professionals working in companies, how do they better secure CCTV and stuff like this? CCTV, if they wanted to keep us out of their CCTVs. The ones that we were able to get into were very weak passwords or they left the admin account in there. You know, from the manufacturer's perspective, they left the instructions online on how to change your password remotely. You know, I don't know how they change that because I guess they need that level of convenience for their customers where they're saying, you know, if you've forgotten your password, then this is how you can change it remotely. And so we use those techniques to get in. Now, some of the camera manufacturers made it more difficult where you had to have key information off the camera, okay, to be able to change the password. To remotely change the password, you had to have key information 
off the camera. That made it more difficult, but we still were able to break some of those as well. I was going to say, it didn't stop you, though, in a lot of cases, it sounds like. It didn't stop, it didn't stop us. It made it more challenging, and that's a good part of, of security. I always tell my students that it's impossible to make things absolutely secure. If somebody wants to get in, and if you are a high-value target, somebody's going to spend the time and resources to get in. But what you want to do is you simply want to make it as hard as possible for them to get in. You want to frustrate them. You want to make it time-consuming. You want them to spend more time and resources. Oftentimes, hackers are opportunistic. They're looking for the easiest target. So if you make it harder, not absolutely secure, but make it harder, they'll simply go to the next guy who's easy. If it takes them years to crack your password, okay, or maybe weeks, they're going to go to the next guy whose password they can crack in minutes. If they're both equal value targets, they're going to go for, you know, it only makes sense, right? If you're, if you're an attacker, you're going to find the easiest target to get into. It's impossible to make it totally secure. I will say that flat out, but you can make it really, really hard. Yeah, it's good advice. I mean, I suppose putting it behind a firewall, not allowing internet access or only allowing internet access with a VPN or something, would you say that's a good idea? Yeah, definitely. I mean, a firewall and maybe an IDS in place, a yeah. good IDS. This is what's happening right now in Ukraine is that the Ukrainians, they actually are using a combination firewall IDS system that's pretty sophisticated. And they're picking up the attacks before they ever get into the system. So, yeah, I, I would recommend both of those. Of course, you want to lock down your systems as best you can. You know, the, the cardinal rules of making sure everything's patched, you know, making sure you don't have any excess unneeded services running. Put a good IDS firewall in place. Only allow access that absolutely has to be there. Block everything that you don't need. I've gone into companies and uh, we look at, for instance, their firewall, and there'll be many openings on their firewall. And I'll say, hey, you know, you don't need all of these ports open. And the administrator will say, well, they were open when I was hired here three years ago. And, of course, obviously they must be needed if they were here when I got here. And I said, well, you know, who's using these ports? What, what services are using these ports? And I go, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, the way to find out is to close them. And see who screams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and you know, it's amazing how many times people will tell me, uh, no, no, I don't want to do that because that's I'm going to lose my job if I do that. Right? And and, until, said, they, you know, until they're hacked. Until they're hacked. I said, and I said yeah, you're going to lose your job when you get hacked. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's kind of, you know, the cardinal rules of, of keeping the system secure. Try to lock down everything you can. Make sure your passwords are, are complex. If you can use two-factor authentication, great. There are even limitations to two-factor authentication. It's possible to hack the cellular system and get the second the two-factor authentication, but you're just making it harder. Put up some additional barriers. Make sure you turn off all the unneeded services. Make sure that nothing's running. The more things that are running on your system, the greater your attack surface is. You've got lots of services that you're not using. Each one of those services has a vulnerability. Each service has a vulnerability. The more vulnerabilities you're presenting to the attacker, the less secure you are. Yeah, it's all basic stuff. Most professionals know this. The problem is the implementation thereof. Exactly. Execution yeah. is really the problem. I mean, it's it, all of the rules are simple. Right? Yeah. <laughs> the simples are the rules are simple. Execution is hard work. Very much and so. that's where that's where you get the, the the failings. Yeah, I mean, there's been so many examples. I think what was the recent one where guys were putting their passwords in Slack, and that's how attackers got into a lot of uh, systems. I mean, it's basic stuff to dumb things, but humans again, I'm sorry, I have to say humans again, making bad choices. Um, well, I mean, okay, we, I just, the only thing I have a problem with is I just don't like to, to denigrate human beings. Yeah. We're all, we're all, we all have our frailties. We all have our, exactly. our flaws. Yeah. Some of us are more security aware than others. And I think some people in the security industry tend to to denigrate their users, yeah. okay? And that's not the way to get a system secure, no. you know? If you start denigrating the users or thinking that they are the, the flaw or the weakness in your system, you know, that's going to show up in your attitude towards them. And if it shows up in your attitude towards them, you're not going to get cooperation. 
So that's my problem with, yeah. with, with that idea of always talking about the human being the, the weakest link in the system. That creates an attitude that we know and you guys don't. You guys are dumb and we're smart. And then that creates an attitude where create this gap between the security people and the average user. They're not dumb. They're just not aware. And you need to embrace them and bring them into your circle to get them to cooperate and work with you to keep the entire system secure. If you keep on thinking of them as dumb and weak, then you're not going to get that kind of cooperation that you need to make the system secure. That's great advice. Well, what I wanted to talk about a little bit, the last video is really relevant because we saw Russia this week try to take out the electrical grid. So we are going to round two here. They tried to take out the electrical grid in Ukraine with Industroyer which is often called crash override, goes by different names. It's basically a, a piece of malware that targets electrical grid. They tried to take out Kiev, and uh, luckily they were able to stop it. Also, like the next day, the U.S. CERT announced that they had found a SCADA toolkit, a SCADA ICS toolkit that is capable of hacking many, many, many systems. And they call it kind of a, a Swiss army knife of SCADA hacking, which I want to get my hands on. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see if I can get a copy of it. Also, almost simultaneously, CERT announced and others announced that they found a whole slew of new vulnerabilities in Siemens and Schneider Electric systems. And one of them I actually know, knew of already and can exploit. So that one is... It's going to be patched, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> there's actually, a, a, in the side, the, the Schneider Electric, there's actually a, a memory area where the password hash is passed unencrypted. Okay, so it's, it's hashed, but it's being transferred unencrypted. So if you can access that memory area, and it's easy to access that memory area, then you can just grab the hash and then pass the hash as a password. So oh, wow. we'll, we'll see if the we'll see if the Russians uh, patch their systems, but they've got about uh, 360, 100, 370 of the Schneider Electric systems, and there's also a, a DOS attack that was revealed by uh, or patched by Schneider. You know, I hate to pick on Schneider, but I've been working with Schneider systems for a while, and they are so full of vulnerabilities, in part because they're older systems. They've been around for longer than anybody. So they've been building systems since like 1978. They've got these embedded systems in there that have been around for 44 years. <laughs> and when they first started building these systems in the late 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, and I would say even into the 21st century, they really weren't thinking about security at all. So you've got systems out there that are old, there's no security on them, and those systems are really vulnerable. Like this most current vulnerability where, you know, they're past, they've hashed the password, but then they're passing it unencrypted, you know, <laughs> through yeah. the system, right? And their systems, you can actually read memory areas from the outside. As an outsider, I can go in and pull the memory areas out of their systems and read their memory. That's what this particular exploit is is about is being able to grab the hash of the password and then you can replay the password it was kind of timely everything was about SCADA this week right? it was it was uh the russians trying to attack the electrical grid on wednesday i think and then uh the uh SCADA ICS toolkit came out. I think Siemens had like 11 vulnerabilities patched and mm -hmm. Schneider had two major vulnerabilities patched. One of the things I want to say about SCADA systems is that DOSing, you know, our traditional TCP IP systems, you know, is inconvenient. You know, it interrupts with communication. DOSing a SCADA system can be deadly. Very different in severity between the two. So if you can DOS a SCADA system, oftentimes, you can make it inoperable and unmanageable, in which case the operators, managers can't actually manage the system, and that can lead to dangerous conditions within the facility. So DOSing has a whole different level of severity when we're talking about SCADA systems. You mentioned an example in our previous interview, which I'll link below, uh, that um, it can 
it can blow up a power plant or something, yeah? Yeah, I mean, in this case, if I can get inside of a facility, many of these facilities, you can read the memory areas off the PLCs, and some of them you can write to the PLCs. Now, if you can write to the PLCs, that means that you can turn on and off various switches. So imagine a switch that manages the pressure inside a facility, like a refinery, right? They've got to, they got to manage the pressure constantly. Pressure gets too high, you have to do something. You got to open a valve, right? If I can take control of either one of those, then they can lead to explosive results. <laughs> I'm not I'm not advocating that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> SCADA hacking goes beyond simply revealing confidential information, credit card numbers, that type of thing. We're talking about turning a facility into a weapon. We've spoken offline, and one of the things you wanted to talk about was like the... Um the history of attacks against Ukraine's uh, SCADA systems. You want to mention that here? Well, you know, there's been there's been a number of attacks against SCADA systems in Ukraine that go all the way back. They go back quite a ways, um, at least to 2014, where we saw both in 20 the winter of 2014 and 20 winter of 2015, we saw the Russians be able to turn out the lights. And they use black energy on those attacks. It's an old piece of malware that's been around for years, that's been reconstituted. And, you know, the Russians are really good at persistent social engineering. Now, I have to tell you that the other day I did an interview with um, French national TV news. We were talking about these similar issues. And the interviewer, so I'm going to get divert to a, what I think is a crucial issue that we have to address right now, and that is the interviewer had just come back from Ukraine, and he was, one, he was appalled by what he saw. Okay, he said he couldn't believe what he saw. Uh, and he went to Bucha and saw the atrocities there. Anybody who tells you those didn't happen, they're lying to you or they're misinformed. There's people coming back who just can't believe what they saw in Bucha. He was one of them. He's an investigative reporter who came back from Bucha, and he was doing a report for French national television, which should be out in the next week or so, on the cyber war in Ukraine. One way or another, he came to me and asked me a number of questions for this documentary he's doing. And he came to me and he said, talking to the hackers in Ukraine, they say that the Russian hackers, like the Russian military, are way overrated. And they said it was they've had a lot of success in being able to stop the Russians. And they said the Russians are not very good and uh, I had a couple things to say in that interview, and that is, one, one, you know, one of the key elements of any type of warfare is never underestimate your opponent. And that's going to be your downfall. I encouraged everyone not to underestimate the Russians. Two, like any profession, there's different levels, yeah. okay? Whether you're talking about soccer or basketball, you have the great players and you have the mediocre players. Same goes for hackers. There's great hackers and there's mediocre hackers. The Russians, I don't think, have played their best hackers in Ukraine yet. You know, we're going to see them soon. Just like they underestimated Ukraine militarily. They thought they were just going to walk into Ukraine and take over. They didn't really feel like they needed their best assault on their systems now. So they put in the second team. <laughs> they put in they put in the mediocre hackers and the Ukrainians were able to stop them. They've been attacking me as well. And so far I've been unimpressed, okay, with their attacks against me. Soon they're going to send in the first team. And that's going to be a whole different ball game. Third thing I want to point out is that the, the Russians, they are persistent. They never stop. They never give up. Just because you repel them today, they'll be back tomorrow, and they'll be back the next day, and they'll be back the next day. And every day, they'll try a slightly different method to get you. Quite frankly, a lot of it is simply social engineering. Like I'm getting a huge number of really look like really legitimate links coming to me in Twitter. I'm getting lots of emails that look like they're legitimate coming to me of, of people that I know sending me links. They're all Russian intelligence. And this is what the Russians do until they get you to make one mistake. They keep on trying and they keep on trying and they keep on trying. Now, let's go back to Ukraine, 2014, 2015. 
black energy it was a really good piece of malware, but it required that one person click on a link. And once that one person did it, they were inside the facility. And then they were able to move from inside the corporate network into the SCADA network and then turn off the breakers. What I, I guess I want to emphasize is that just because you repel the Russians now, they're going to be back tomorrow and they're going to be back the next day and they're going to be back the next day. I mean, if you've ever, I raise chickens, okay? I raise chickens. I live in the mountains and I raise chickens. I've got foxes up in the woods here and the foxes, they never give up. <laughs> they, every day they come and they look for a way into the chicken coop to eat the chickens. <laughs> and, and they are really smart. Okay. They're really smart. And if you make one mistake, they'll eat all your chickens. <laughs> the Russians are like that. They come every day and they look for you to make one mistake. Okay. And if you make one mistake, they'll eat all your chickens. All right. And that's what they did in 2014, 2015. They tried in Destroyer, I guess in 2018, 2019, they used Hermetic Wiper just recently. Um, Hermetic Wiper was a, a piece of malware that went in and basically wiped out all the data. And almost all of these attacks, they're really sophisticated malware, but it requires some form of social engineering. A lot of hackers, especially beginning hackers, like to underestimate the power and importance of social engineering. People focus on the techie stuff, don't they? Exactly. The techie stuff is what happens after you social engineer. <laughs> Once you're inside, like Black Energy 3 is very sophisticated piece of malware. Once you're inside, it doesn't have a way of getting inside except by social engineering. It used a, a, a flaw in uh, Microsoft Office. And so what the Russians did in that case is that they sent a email from an email address that looked like it was an official governmental email address. And they sent it to somebody inside the electrical company. And all it took was one person to click on it. And then they were inside the network. And then from there, it was amazing how technical and how effective it was. But it still required some form of social engineering. And sometimes all it takes is finding somebody who the target is familiar with taking over their email and sending an email from that email address to you. It's coming from somebody you know and trust, right? But you don't know that it's actually coming from an attacker from Russia. Sometimes they'll use you know, email addresses that are very similar and you'll just not pay that close of attention and click on it. These are some of the major attacks that Russia has done. They've got a number of pieces of malware out there that are specific to SCADA right now, and they still haven't used them in the West or in Ukraine, but I expect they will as we go to round two. Okay, this is round two of the Ukraine cyber war, and I think we're going to see a lot more from the Russians in terms of SCADA attacks. You know, they've started this week. They tried to attack the electrical grid again, but they're not done. They will come back and they'll come back and they'll come back and they'll come back. Even if you've got the second team who isn't you know, necessarily the best hackers in the world, they're still there every day. They're there every day trying to find a hole in your armor. It's a warning for anyone who thinks they want to get involved in this, isn't it? They have to be really, really careful. I think so. I think, you know, one of the things that I think we want to talk about now is that, you know, the Russians have warned that they're coming after anybody who's participated. I mentioned this in our first video, and they said they identified 17,000 IP addresses, when in actuality, there was well over 100,000. But they made it clear that they are going to retaliate against those people. So those of you who you know, thank God for you who are participating in this. You got to be on your toes, okay? Because, you know, they're coming after us. I'm seeing the attacks now. I've seen attacks against my website. I've seen attacks against me or attempted attacks. They've tried dossing my website. My website's gone down for short periods of time. So far, it hasn't been very successful. They've tried social engineering me. So far, I haven't made any mistakes, but there's been some social engineering attacks that look really convincing. But right now, I'm on heightened alert. Normally, I'm I'm really skeptical of anything that comes in through email. And I should probably tell that to everybody, right? <laughs> Is that anything that comes into you from Twitter, comes into you from Facebook, comes into you from email, comes into you from any social uh, media, be skeptical. 
don't click, don't give any information. I have so many people now who are coming to me and, and want to participate. I get probably 100 requests a day. Some of them are coming from Russians and they are, are sending me, well, I want to participate. You know, let me show you what my desktop looks like. Here's what I've got, you know, and they want me to <laughs> click. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but they come, yeah. they come, they, they come to me saying, you know, they want to help Ukraine, right? And they're sending me information, various information, different links. And I have to say, I'm sorry if I haven't responded to you or if I've told you I can't click on your link. I will not open up your uh, email links or your Twitter direct messages. You could communicate in other ways, but I'm not going to click on anything. I've got to be very careful at this point. And you should be very careful too if you've been participating in this action. And how do you stop social engineering attacks? You've mentioned like don't click on links, don't trust emails, don't trust DMs, don't touch, trust social media links. Any other tips? Be cautious and be skeptical of everything. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what I am. I've been doing this for years and uh, I'm really, really skeptical. And I very seldom will open up anything. You know, obviously you sent me a link for this meeting. So I clicked on that. I yeah. trust you. But that's the kind of thing that a Russian would do too, right? Oh, yeah. Is that yeah. they would say, okay, you know, I'm David Bombo and here's the link for our meeting, right? And then that will bring them into my system and they can take control of it. And But that's uh, that's the kind of thing you got to be really careful of. It's a warning, once again, for anyone who wants to participate. Uh, you need to be cognizant of the repercussions of what you're doing. Exactly. And I just want to kind of finish this thought, and that is probably 80 to 90% of the major hacks of the world are, have a social engineering element. For those of you who are starting out in this field or are new to this field, okay, you know, you're going to see in your training these hacks that work, you know, against whatever, you know, Microsoft Office or Windows 10 or what have you. But that's rare. What really is happening out there is that most of the attacks require some element of social engineering. You can go through the long list of the major hacks of history, and almost all of them had a social engineering element. Somebody clicked on something somewhere that's going to allow the attacker into their system. Yeah, so the humans are the weakest point. Is that, is, that the, is that the thing? Yeah. That's what everybody says. I hate to think of humans as weak, though. So I, I, <laughs> I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't repeat that line. You know, I mean, we're, 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 we're flawed. Yep. <laughs> we're, we, you know, we all have our flaws and some people are more trusting than others. And, and trust is a good thing. I mean, trust in, in our world as a human being is a good thing to have. Right. But if you're working in this field, you know, you've got to be really distrustful of everything that comes your way. So that may be one of the caveats that we want to leave people with who are entering this field, especially if you're talking about cyber war. I mean, you know, if you're talking about pen testing, you know, you're not going to get attacked. But if you're talking about cyber war, you're going to you're, you're going to be open to attack. You know? And that means that you have to be wary of everything. I am wary of everything. If you're a pen tester, depending upon the scope of your pen test, you might take advantage of somebody else's trust, right? So in some some pen tests, you're allowed to use social engineering. And so one of the things that you know you might want to do is to try to develop your social engineering repertoire so that you can get people to trust you, to be able to send them an email that looks legitimate or a Twitter message or something on Facebook to get them to click on a link. And that's just as important. Some people, you know, some companies won't allow social engineering as part of a pen test. And I think that's wrong because this is the way most systems are compromised is through social engineering. It requires one person out of all the organization, out of the entire organization of maybe thousands or tens of thousands of people. People. One person who can be social engineered, basically that means clicking on a link generally, opening up a document, the attacker takes over that system, and then once they've taken over a system inside the network, it's pretty easy then to move, or easier to move from one system inside the network to other systems inside the network, whether that be the database server, the web server, and then escalating privileges to getting root or system admin. That's a lot easier from the inside than it is from the outside. Once you get inside the system, then things get a lot easier. 
Give us some examples of like, um, we spoke about Stuxnet previously. Have you got any other good examples and stories that you can share in terms of you know, like social engineering, where social engineering got someone into a system? Well, Stuxnet, you know, we don't really know how Stuxnet got into the, the Iranian system. It might have been social engineering. We still don't know. Stuxnet was the attack against the Iranian uh, I, the Iranium uranium <laughs> enrichment facility, all right, at Natanz. It was released in uh, the Middle East, and it spread through the Middle East and throughout the whole world. And so it was on lots and lots of systems, but it was targeted to one specific system in Iran, and that system was air-gapped. So how did it go from spreading around the world from system to system into an air gap system? That's still a mystery, and it may have been somebody inadvertently brought it in on a thumb drive, or it may have been somebody who was an operative of the U.S. In any case, it made it in, and it's probably the most sophisticated piece of SCADA malware we've ever seen. It didn't actually destroy the system. It didn't steal information. It just took the centrifuges that were controlled by these programmable logic controllers and made them spin, made the centrifuges spin at speeds that either destroyed them in some cases or spun too slow so it didn't enrich the uranium. And it took Iran quite a long time to figure out what had actually taken place. But that's probably the most famous and most sophisticated piece of SCADA malware we've ever seen. In the last couple of years, we saw a piece of malware that probably came out of Russia that is known as Triton. Basically, what it does is it disables the Schneider Electric safety systems. There's a fail-safe system that shuts down the system. And this piece of malware basically disables that without the operator knowing that the fail-safe system has been disabled. It's been largely been found in refineries and other type of petrochemical facilities. And that's kind of an example of where, you know, this type of SCADA attack can end up being turned into a weapon. We've got examples in history where facilities have blown up and probably the, the one that's most devastating was in the 80s where this Indian plant made insecticide malfunctioned. It wasn't a cyber attack. It was a malfunction. This is a big facility, chemical facility, that spread insecticide among the population in India and was responsible for killing hundreds of thousands of people. Now, imagine that in a cyber war environment. You know, you're getting into one of these chemical facilities and getting it to malfunction. You can create a lot of havoc. You can make a plant into a weapon. You know, then there's, you know, the possibility of just turning out the lights, turning out electricity. It's pretty hard to function without electricity in a modern era. We're also accustomed to it. We couldn't care. We couldn't do our YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. many, so many things yeah. you can't do without power. Yep. So many things you can't do without electricity. So yeah. Occupy the web. We've been going for quite a while. Did you any? Did you have any last words before we wrap it up? No, I think uh, I think that does it for me today. We should, I got lots of things I can talk about. I can talk for hours. <laughs> no, I, and I want you to. So let, let's say this. For those of you who are watching, um, please put in the comments below the topics or the questions you'd like Occupy the Web to answer. He's got lots of experience uh, doing all kinds of interesting things. So if you want like some stories or some examples or some guidance, please put in the comments below so that we can add that to a future video. Occupy the Web and I are also looking at doing some more technical stuff. So if you want technical demos of, of certain kind of tools or certain things, let us know, put in the comments below. Again, Occupy the Web, thanks so much. Thanks, David.